Well, hello, Freedom Church. It's good to see all your wonderful faces, and I, I'm glad that you made it out. And we are in this message series called Reset as we're looking through different aspects of life and decisions and, and our priorities and, and really looking on how we can reset our life. And, and it's been incredible the past couple of weeks, the way that Pastor T has been leading and teaching those different aspects, the, the priorities, like I mentioned, making right decisions. And he's not able to be here today, but I am, I am so glad that I get to serve with somebody who models and is an example of the things that he talks about. He's the same person off the stage as he is on the stage. And, and I just love being a part of a team uh, with a leader like that. And so he's off, I'm sure, watching somewhere. So hi, Pastor T. And why don't we go ahead and give a big hand, round of applause for Pastor T, the way he leads. Let, let him know that uh, you miss him. And, uh, and we look forward to seeing him next week. But uh, as we, we go into this message series, continue with this reset, uh, let me just start with a word of prayer. And, and Lord, we just come before you and, and we just uh, look to your word, look to your guidance and how we can look at our lives and, and to, to live a life that's worthy for you, that's honoring to you, that's glorifying to you. And so Lord, I just pray that, that you would just uh, speak this morning, that you would uh, just give me the right words to say, Lord. I pray that hearts and minds would be open um, to you and, and to be able to, to really take in all that you have for us today. And so Lord, we just thank you for this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we get into the, this series and going through different aspects today, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about habits and, and some different habits that we have. And I thought it'd be fair to, you know, as I get started, maybe share some of my habits uh, so you don't think that I have it all together because I got some bad habits. Anybody in here have some bad habits? All right, good. I'm not alone. So, so a couple of mine that, that I thought, you know, I'll be a little bit transparent and share. Um, one of those is, is I'm not great about taking out the trash. Um, you see, all my life, I've been responsible for the trash and taking it out. I was the youngest of four, and somehow that ends up being the youngest kid's job. So mom, dad, if you're watching, thanks for always having me do the trash. Um, and, and so then I get married, and I'm thinking, okay, um, I guess I'm still going to be responsible for the, for the trash and taking it out, collecting it through the house, and then taking it out to the curb. Then I have kids. I think, sweet. I'm finally off the hook, right? I can make them do the trash. No, I'm still doing the trash. And it's just like, man, after all these years, I'm still doing the trash. And, and so I, I despise it a bit. I'm just going to be honest. And so my bad habit is I don't like doing it. And so sometimes I don't. And the trash truck comes by and I see it on the street. And then all of a sudden I'm like running it out to the curb um, and getting out there for them to pick it up because it's like, ah, I don't like doing that. Um, something else that I'm notorious around my house for that drives my family crazy is, is tools and leaving them wherever. I don't know if, if uh, you've ever placed some, something someplace and then you forget where it's at and you, then you need it and it's in a different spot than what you thought and you're lost and then all of a sudden it's like, all right, family, come together, uh, help me find my tool that I need right here. Where's my hammer? Has anybody seen my hammer? You know, my kids, I'm sure, are like, why would we know where your hammer is? And, and we're in a bit of a house reno um, right now. And so I got a bunch of like different projects going on. And so I have used tools here and then I use tools here and I use tools here. I can never remember. And then it usually gets frustrating. And then I expect my family to help me find the tools. Um, again, not their fault. So, so I don't know if there's things that you do that drive your family crazy and these bad habits, but, but I got them too. Um, and so here's the thing though, is life isn't just about good habits and bad habits. And so we're not just going to talk about good habits, bad habits today, but what I want to talk about is how a great life is built on the right habits and precise decisions. And, and it's, it's about the right habits. So it's not always looking at great, good and bad, but the right ones. In Ephesians 4, it says this, you are told that your foolish desires will destroy you and that you must give up your old way of life with all its bad habits. Let the spirit change your way of thinking. And make you into a new person. You were created to be like God, and so you must please Him and be truly holy. Now, as we read this, I think it's important to know, and we didn't have it on there, but I want to point out that before this per, before this passage, like the sentence right before what I just read, it says, "Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him." And so, so the parameters that we're going to be talking about today, as far as setting these right habits and allowing the Holy Spirit to change our way of thinking. I think it's important for us to, to actually know Jesus 
And maybe you're somebody here today who's never actually met Jesus. Maybe you've heard the name. Maybe you've heard it as, as a cuss word and, and heard it in the wrong context. But, but you've heard the name of Jesus, but you don't know Jesus. You see, Jesus was fully man and fully God. He was up in heaven and, and descended and was born of a virgin as a baby, lived a perfect life because our sin, our wrongdoings, right? I said, how many of us have some bad habits, um, right? We've all done something wrong. That has separated us from God. And, and because God is perfect and we're imperfect, right? It's like oil and water. It doesn't mix. And so there's the separation from God. And so, so the only way to redeem that is through the sacrifice of Jesus. And so Jesus came and lived the perfect life, became the perfect sacrifice, did something that none of us can do, and he did it for us. Though he was condemned as a criminal, he had done nothing wrong. And what he did is he did that for us so that we can have that right relationship. Because if we truly believe in Jesus, who he is, because he said that he was Lord, he claimed to be Lord. If we truly believe that Jesus is Lord, that he died for our sins, and then rose again on the third day, that is how that relationship is repaired. It's nothing that we do. It's nothing that we can boast about. It's not the, the good works that we do, but it is that belief and that faith that we put in him. And so then, as you make that decision in your life, then he sends a gift. A gift greater than any other gift, of not only of salvation, but of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, also God. You see, God is in three persons. Don't let, that's a whole other topic as far as explaining the Trinity. But you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so he sends us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, to live in us, so that we can know right from wrong, so we can can have guidance. He doesn't just leave us alone and say, hey, great, thanks for for now we we got this relationship repaired. He actually gives us the tools in order to live a life in communion and connection with him. And so that's what it's talking about here, is, is for those that have been introduced to Jesus, all of you have now been introduced to Jesus. There's a whole lot more to him than that, but, but you've been introduced, and you have given your life to him. I think it's so important. It says, let the Spirit change your way of thinking and make you into a new person. So where the old is gone and the new has come. And so, so that's, that's what he's talking about. And, and so you need to accept him and, and talk about how the Spirit can guide us. And here's the thing is, is that spirit will guide us to become more like God, right? How do, we, how do we continue to become more like God and to put our old self away and become a new person? And, and it's this process. It's an ongoing process. We haven't got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. It's not an overnight story that all of a sudden my life is perfect, right? And I'm suddenly perfect, right? We've made righteous, right? God sees us through the lens of Jesus, but there's still this process of becoming more like Jesus. Now, that's what we're talking about. But it's not overnight success. It's been said that successful people spend years becoming an overnight success. All right, think about that. It takes years becoming an overnight success. Here's the thing is, when you hear of overnight success, people, like all of a sudden they just popped up on the radar, like, hey, where do they come from? They seem really successful. No one sees the, re- the, the, the things that took it to, took it took it them to get there. Wow, that was tongue twister there. Um, I mean, that's a bad habit of mine. Um, the truth is, it's the things that no one sees that results in the things that everyone wants. You look at overnight success and you're like, I want that. I want what they have. But we don't see the work that it took to get there. And so you may see people's success and, and think that it happened, but it, it didn't just happen overnight. So I want to take a look at somebody in the Bible who, who a lot of times you think of when you hear their story, there's like one specific day that seems highlighted above, above all other days. And you think that it's just like this, all of a sudden, this one day that this happened and that's the whole story. So I want to look at the, the story of Daniel. Maybe you're, you're familiar with the, the title of Daniel in the lion's den. And, and you, for many, you might be familiar with that, but for, for some, you might not. And so, so here's the thing is with, with Daniel... And the lion's den, where he gets thrown into the lion's den, a lot of times people stick, that's the story. But there's always a story behind the story. There's a story of how did he get there and how did he get out. And so uh, just giving you some, a little bit of reference, Israel was captured. They were taken into exile um, through one king and then another king comes along. And, and so now in, in this story, King Darius is the king of Persia. And, and it, with that, the kingdom grew, and he decided to appoint 120 governors for all the regions of the kingdom. 
And, and really, he was strategic in using local people. So the people that they brought in out of exile, they looked for people from like royalty and high class and, and well put together and strong and fit and wise. And, and then they put them through a series of training for like three years to bring them up on things and, and help develop them as leaders. And so, and so Daniel was one of these, these people that was put in charge of regions. And through the great ability that God gave him and wisdom and knowledge and and strength and, and all these different aspects, he rose through the ranks and basically became Darius, King Darius' right-hand man. And so King Darius loved Daniel. They, they, they were connected. He appreciated him. He had great favor with him. And so because he was so favored by King Darius, he started making the other officials jealous, especially the other officials of that region. And, and thinking, why does, why does this foreigner, why is this exile get to be so highly ranked. And so that's where we're going to pick up in Daniel 4, or I'm sorry, Daniel 6, verse 4. It says, Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, Our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So the administrators and high officers went to the king and said, Long live King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, officials, high officers, advisors, and governors, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced, give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except you, your majesty, will be thrown into the den of lions. So here you got these other officials. How do we bring Daniel down? I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where that, where it seems like you're doing the right thing and other people are out to get you and backstab you and try to uh, pull you down. And so this is happening with Daniel and they couldn't find anything wrong with him. They couldn't find an accusation. He was squeaky clean, right? In, in the days of mudslinging in politics, they couldn't find it with him, right? Mudslinging in politics has been around for a long time, apparently. But he was flawless in these things. And so they went for the thing that they knew he was committed to. They knew Daniel was committed to God. They knew Daniel had a strong relationship with God. They knew Daniel was strong in his faith and how much he loved God. And that was their ticket to bring him down. Is We got to change the rules. We got to change the law. Let's make one that is opposite of what he's known to do. That was it. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. They couldn't change him, so let's change something else. And so now we have this as we continue on. It says, but when Daniel learned that this law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room. With this window open towards Jerusalem, he prayed three times a day, just as he always done, giving thanks to his God. Then the officials went together to Daniel's house and found him praying and asking for God's help. So literally, they just wrote a death sentence to him. He knew it. As soon as he heard that the law was signed into it, he's like, this is a death sentence, right? I should go into hiding. I, I, I should lay low. I should be, start a secret church, or I should, should just disappear. No. What does he do? He does what he always did, meaning he had this habit. It's a habitual effort that Daniel made every single day to go and spend time with God. And not just once, not twice, but three times. Specific times that he would go and be in communion with God and have a conversation with him and talk to him. And then also in this, he doesn't go and he does, it says it doesn't go and start complaining. Has anybody in here ever complained to God? I've complained to God. I've complained to him a lot when things don't go right. I've never had the death sentence put on my head, but I probably would complain about that and freak out a little. <laughs> what does he do? He says, he goes... And he gives thanks to his God. Man, that is faith. That even in the, what the troubling circumstances are, to go and give thanks to God. And then he asks them for help, right? They say when they go to his house, they find him praying and asking for God's help. Because he knew God's the only way to get out of this. He's the only solution in this. But at the end of the day, even if there wasn't a solution, he went to the person who he loved and cared the most for. In the hurt, in the dark, in the alone time that he was feeling at that moment, he went to the most trusted source he knew, God. So Daniel gets arrested. He gets thrown into the lion's den. And, and because I believe in his relationship with God, God sees him the way that he was continued in it regardless of the situation. 
God sends an angel down into the lion's den and shuts the mouths of lions. And I think it's just an incredible thing to, to, to hear this story. We talk about it and the great faith that he had and the amazing things that God does. And that's the part of the story that most people know and we stick on to it. A lot of times, you know, we see the story and it's like, boom, God steps in an amazing way. And we use those stories for hope and, and belief that God will step in and protect us from threats or take care of our problems. And God can and he will do that. But I think many of us, that doesn't always happen. And we wonder why. Why didn't God show up and shut the mouths of the lions in my life? Why does it feel like I got attacked? I think one of the reasons, and, and this is not an all-inclusive one answer for all things. It's not the indicator of all circumstances. But I think we have to realize this in faith. Is, is that, that his relationship, Daniel's relationship with God, didn't just start the night before this happened. It had been a lifelong decision, a lifetime of sacrifice with his eating habits. You, you know, you can learn about the Daniel fast. Many people in the church are, are in the middle of a Daniel fast. We've, we've uh, tried to lead in that as a church to say, hey, let's do a Daniel fast. You can read the book of Daniel. We've got some resources about that around to, to help guide you in that. We've got some pamphlets that talk about the Daniel fast. And it is a sacrifice that he took in his, in his eating habits to make God the priority, not the things that most people put their hope in when it comes to food. So it was a lifetime of sacrifices, a lifetime of habits of spending time with God and growing his relationship with you. If you want a strong relationship, you have to spend time with the other person. I've, I've met with some people before and they, they come in and they start telling me about some of their struggles and the hardships and then they sit there and say, I, I just don't know where God is in all of this. And I've asked the question to them and, and, uh, and say, okay, prior to this situation, what was your relationship with God like before that? Did, were you spending time with him? Were you in communion with him? Were, were, you, were you growing in your re- relationship with God? And they sit there and like, no, but I need him now. Yes, and God will show up in those times when he needs you. But when you sit there and say, I don't know where God is, and you've done nothing to pour into that relationship, is that really a fair question? How many times is God sitting there saying, I don't know where you are. Why are you not coming to me? relationships are mutual. There's two sides to it. And God is always standing right there ready for you. Wherever you run from him, one turn, he's right there, right behind you, ready for you to turn. He's running right after you. God desires a relationship with you, not just a religion, not just a box to check, not just a genie in a bottle that comes in um, hard times, but he wants a real relationship with you. Could you imagine how my marriage, your marriage, anybody's marriage would be if the only time that you talk to your spouse is when you need something? Like if the only, if the only question I ever asked my wife was when's dinner or what's for dinner? And then I eat and then we go separate ways. And I don't talk to her about anything else, but every single day I say, okay, what's for dinner? And the next day, what's for dinner? Next day, what's for dinner? If that's literally the only conversation I have with my wife, how do you think that marriage is going to go? <laughs> It'd be, wow. All right, we got somebody with sarcasm over here. If you didn't hear him, he said, you'd be full. Um, I don't know, because probably after the fourth or fifth time, and that's the only time that you're, you're asking, the food might get cut off. <laughs> so, so maybe not. I don't know, but that's funny. Um, that's a guy after my own heart over there. <laughs> but here's the thing, right? You get the point at the end of the day. If, if you want a real, real relationship, there's got to be some back and forth. It can't just be when, when you need it most. Like I said, God is not this genie in the bottle. And so, uh, fortunately, God is way more forgiving than my wife would be if that's the only conversation I'd have. God is way more forgiving of, of our transgressions and our wrongdoings and our problems. He is right there ready to forgive. So, as we go through and we talk through this, I, I thought it'd be good to share some habits um, that are holy, that we can develop. And really, um, how do we get there so that we can actually be in a real relationship? And so when it talks about life decisions or relationship with God, um, let's talk about making holy habits. All right? It's not about good habits or bad habits. Let's make holy habits. And the first one I want to share is, is to want what God wants, to desire what God desires. This means for you to live a life for God on purpose with eternal perspective. 
Not just in your own bottle, not with your blinders on, just not in your own life that you ignore the world around you, but to have eternal perspective of the life here on earth and the life that is to come in heaven. And for those around you and those that, that need that reality, that need the, the opportunity to have eternity in heaven. And Micah 6 eight says, No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good. This is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God wants to change lives. He wants us to do what's right. He wants us to, to love mercy, to have mercy on other people, to, to walk humbly with him, to put him first, to lower our, our expectations of ourselves and to, to promote him and to follow him. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. Now, some people will read that as like, okay, God's going to give me whatever I want. I, that's not the way I read it. When I read it, it says, take delight in the Lord. That means, is, are you um, taking delight in God in all of his ways? Are you taking delight in his Bible, his word to us? Are you taking delight in his people that, that he has chosen and in and, and, and communion with? Do you take delight in, in the world that he's created? Have you taken delight in all the aspects of, of God and all of his ways? So there's that part, side of it. And it says, if you do that, if you take delight in the Lord in all of his ways, I think he will give you your heart's desires, meaning he will place the desires that you have in your heart. All of a sudden, you start meshing. When you're in, in communion with God, your desires and his desires mesh, and our desires start aligning with what he desires, in which case then we want what he wants. We don't want what I want. And putting aside our selfish desires, we want what God wants. We want his ways. We want his purpose. We want his love. We want his community. And no doubt we've all made selfish decisions that we regret. You know, maybe it's a financial decision where you made a big purchase and put you in debt. So maybe a, a habit that you want to work through is putting your finances in order. Maybe we've made decisions on food because of the flavor or the taste or the convenience of it. Or going through fast food and it's like it's just easier to go out and eat. Right? Sometimes that can be a burden on, on our finances, but it can also be a burden on our body. That stuff isn't necessarily healthy. For me, I love pop. Some of you might be like, what's pop? Well, let me translate. Soda. <laughs> or let, me, let me translate one more farther. farther. Coke. I think that's, that's what it's called, right? Everything's Coke, which confuses me because I like Mountain Dew, and Mountain Dew is not Coke. When two things are different, they're not the same. But yeah, I, yeah it's a rabbit trail. I, I apologize. But, but I, really, I really love soda and Coke, Mountain Dew, Dr. Pepper. I, I love these, these sugary beverages that are horrible for my body. They just are. Let's face it. I love them. I'm not drinking any pop right now, so I just had that moment of thinking about the days when I drank pop. But here's the thing is, is it's not healthy. So maybe, maybe it's making the right decisions in how we're eating, or maybe it's exercising. It's not easy. It's not convenient to exercise, but it's what your body likes and makes you healthier. Maybe your schedule's overloaded where, where you're putting in tons of time at work. You're doing like 70 hours a, a week at work and you're, you're, you're not with your family. You're thinking, you know what? This is helping me pay for the family and, and the lifestyle that they want. But maybe it's not the lifestyle that they want. It's the lifestyle that you want. All they want is you around more maybe, right? So maybe it's putting, putting some habits as to, to our schedule and our time. Right? Maybe you need to start making a habit of saying no to, the, to some things and more yeses to the things God wants. Because ultimately, it's we want what God wants. So the next habit um, or step that I want you to take is one, right? Figure out the things that God wants. Knit your, your heart to his. But then start with one thing. I think if you go and you say, okay, I got all these bad habits I need to get rid of, or I need to make all these new habits, like, yeah, you talked about food, I need the food thing. Yeah, you talked about finances, I need the finances thing. I, you talked about my marriage, yeah, I need the marriage thing, right? You start thinking through, it's like, man, where do I start? Start with one thing. Just start with one thing. If you try to do it all at once, you're, you're going to fail. It needs to have focus. So just start with one thing. In Zechariah 4.10, it says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Right? Start, start with something small, attainable, achievable. And just the one thing so that you can give it focus. There's a few things I've tried over the years uh, to, to help with, with some of these habits and things like that. Uh, one of them is taking walks with my wife. Okay, all honesty, she started it and I joined in. But I joined in, right? And so it started being something that we did together. And so not only did this help with, with my health, 
right? Because we live in a hilly neighborhood and going up and down those hills gets tiring, especially when I'm pushing a kid in a stroller. Um, and and so, so that helps with the health, but it also helped with time with my spouse to where we have a half an hour, 45 minutes a day of, of actually talking and being in conversation and putting our devices aside and, and being outdoors, which hopefully this weather gets a little bit warmer here soon um, to be more outdoors. But we designate time in, I designate time in the morning for reading the Bible. Maybe, maybe that's something. Um, fasting is something that I've, I've tried to, uh, a practice I've tried to do over the years. Where I'm like, I've talked about that a little bit more uh, today as far as like with the fasting. I think that that's a, a spiritual habit, a holy habit that really ties you in a dependence to God. When you put aside the things that your body really desires, then I think that it, 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 and you focus on God, I think that really builds you up. But here's the thing is, is you don't start all these at once, but they build up over time. The next one is this, don't procrastinate. Two of the biggest mistakes you can make are not starting and not finishing. And for me, this, this one of all of these is the butt kicker for me. Are you allowed to say butt in church? No. But, but procrastinate, I'm a procrastinator. I, I, I like to put things off. Maybe it's because of the challenge. I need a challenge. I don't, I don't like things to be too easy. Well, sometimes I do, but, but I, I like the challenge. And so I kind of put this challenge in front of me. And if I put it off, all of a sudden it was like, all right, it's go time. Now it has to happen. And it, it's, you know, that, that crunch time and, and trying to figure out in the moment if I'm able to do this and succeed. Or maybe it's overconfidence that I can d- get it done in a short amount of time, shorter than what I think. Um, or it could be that I really don't want to do it, and so I avoid it, right? Any one of those things leads to procrastination. And then it, it ultimately leads to more stress. It diverts us from being things. If you get it knocked out of the way, then you have other time to focus on things. Uh, it, it really is a, a healthier mindset to not procrastinate. And so right now, this is what I want you to do is make a list. Make a list. It really, it's a short list because it should only be one thing. Um, but write down the one thing that you're going to start today. Don't put it off. Pull out your phone make a note, pull out your phone, text yourself. I don't know if you knew this, you can text yourself to reminders and ideas and things like that. So pull out your, seriously, pull out the phone right now, text yourself the one thing that you want to, to focus on today. Don't put it off. And if you're trying to think of something that God wants, like we talked about, um, one of the things that I thought might be a good place to start is like here at Freedom, we have our high five values. And, and our high five values is everyone reaching. Right, so maybe the one thing is to be open about your faith at, at work. Maybe it's to invite one person a week to church, right? So now we're starting, what, what does God want? He wants us to be thinking outwards. So I'm going to start inviting one person every single week to church to come with me. Maybe it's uh, the high five value of everyone growing, right? Growing in our faith. Maybe it's setting 15 minutes a day reading the Bible and praying. Maybe that's something that is not a habit of yours. Write that down. I think that's a great one to start if that's not a habit of yours. Uh, maybe it's uh, along the lines of everyone serving. Join a ministry team. Serve twice a month. It's like three, three hours a, a month. Just so you know, there's 730 hours a month. So three hours over 730 is not too bad. So join a ministry team if you're not on a team. Everyone giving. Um, take the 90-day t- uh, tie challenge. Uh, you can go to freedomfamily.us slash give. Go to our website slash give to, to learn more about the 90-day tie challenge. Or maybe it's about getting a hold of your budget. Maybe you need to go through Financial Peace University. Maybe you need to get some budget counseling. But maybe it's, it, that allows you to give generously when you're, you have your budget under control. Or everyone connecting. Jump in a connection group to be a part of the community here at Freedom. Maybe you need to grow in your marriage. In two weeks, we're going to kick off a new message series called Adam and Eve. And we're going to be talking about relationships. Right? Maybe that's something that, that, that you could really use. Or maybe you know somebody that could use that. Invite them with you. But here's the thing is in Galatians 6, 9, it says this. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. And so with this, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. So don't give up. Go, go and, and, and set forth this one thing. Don't wait. and Make sure it's something that God wants. And the final point here is, as we wrap up is to have accountability. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. You're not in this alone. You should not be in this alone. If you want to make holy habits, in order to make a habit, you need to have the right support system. There's a a time in my life that, that things were not 
great for me. My focus was off. My direction was off. Um, you know, I was doing things that, that I wasn't proud of. And I needed a switch. I needed a reset in my life. So that's something that my wife and I have talked about and reset. And, and she's amazing. All right. She helps me, helps hold me accountable. But I ended up going to one of my best friends and just said, hey, I'm trying to make this change in my life. Will you help me in this? And he did. And during that tough time, his name was Chris. And during that tough time, I probably wouldn't have made it through without him. Of him checking in with me on a regular basis. To say, hey, how are you doing? You got this. He was an encourager. He was a challenger. But he held me accountable to help me get to where I wanted to go. And so I was upfront and honest with him and said, hey, here's exactly what's been, been going on and here's where I want to be. Will you help me get there? Don't go through this alone. If you want to set holy habits, it's going to be tough. It's going to be sacrifice. It's going to be hard. Get the right support system around you. And as we mentioned earlier in Ephesians, let the Holy Spirit in. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Because that is going to be the source. And so who, who, you're questioning, who should I have hold accountable? Someone who says and pushes you to follow the Holy Spirit's leading, to set aside your own desires and, and to seek after God's. I mentioned my wife is a good uh, accountable. One of the things that we do um, is during our devotions, I use the Uversion app on my phone. And when I'm done with, with the devotion that I'm doing, I take a screenshot and I send it to her. Right? It's this open line of communication. I'm like, hey, this is what I'm doing. And then we can talk about that. And, and, and to know that we're both pursuing Jesus. So find the people in your life that you can hold accountable and then you can do this together. So in Daniel's life, how did his life continue? Well, one, he survived the lion's den, right? Angel came, shut the mouths of the lions, turned them into big house cats. King Darius opens it up the next day. He survived. He yanks him out of there and, and gives him a big hug and kiss and says, I'm so glad you made it and that your God showed up. And then he said, take those guys who accused you and throw them in there. Not only them, but their families. And they threw in the, all the accusers and their families. And before their bodies even hit the ground, the lions tore them to shreds. that's something that God is willing to do for you. But don't just expect them to always show up out of the blue. Start now in your active decision to have the right relationship with him so that there's no surprise when you call on him. He won't be like, oh, who's this? He knows you. You know him and is an intimate relationship. So you may think his prayer life was insignificant. That three times a day, that oftentimes gets overlooked. But that is what started it. Years prior, his habit of spending time with God. So if you want to reset in life, a new path to succeed and prosper, then you need to want what God wants. You need to follow the Holy Spirit, get the right support around you, and don't give up. And lastly, start now. Let's pray. As we bow our heads and close our eyes and, and remove distractions from around us, earlier on in the message, I, I introduced you to Jesus. And, and shared how he can be the one that can make the impact in your life so much different. That he can change the trajectory of your life. Maybe you're somebody that you've never made that decision to put your trust in him. You've never said, I've chosen to follow him. To put him number one in my life. I want to give you that opportunity today. And you can do that just simply by talking to him. And so I'm going to lead in a prayer. And if you've never made that decision you want to make it today, then, then just have this conversation with God. The words don't matter but it's about the heart and turning to him. So Lord, we come to you. We recognize that, that we have done wrong, that we're sinners, that we missed the mark. But Lord, we know that you are perfect and that your son was perfect and that he died for us. So the best way that I know how, I ask you to come into my life. I surrender to you. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you in all of your ways. I receive your Holy Spirit to guide me. Lord, I thank you and I love you. With your head still down, if you're somebody who made that decision, I would love to be able to pray for you. I'd love to meet you. I'll be hanging out in the Next Steps area after the service. Come over and introduce yourself. I can talk. But if you could just raise your hand 
so that I can, can see you and know that that decision was made um, so I can pray for you and just hope that there's, there is a step in the right direction as you continue. So if that's you, just simply raise your hand. All right, thank you. I saw that hand. So let's pray as we wrap up this. And so Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done for us to show us the right way, to give us a, a peace and a path to making holy habits. Lord, I pray that we would pursue you and to honor you and want what you want. And so, Lord, we just thank you for all this, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.